There's always been an innovation economy, and JP Morgan has an entire business dedicated to helping it thrive. By bringing together founders, startups, investors, and ideas, JP Morgan's Commercial Bank helps empower thousands of high growth companies, companies that are shaping the present and the future. With tailored banking solutions and a global business network, JP Morgan helps innovators scale for today and tomorrow. Visit jpmorgan.com forward slash startups to find out how they can help you build your future. Products and services of JP Morgan Chase and Company and its affiliates are subject to availability, eligibility, and applicable terms and policies. JP Morgan Chase Bank NA member FDIC. Hey everyone, welcome to TechCrunch Live, where we help founders build better venture-backed businesses. I'm Matt Burns, and I think I can speak for everyone when I say uh, compliance training sucks. I hate doing it. I had to do it today. I hate the programs I have to use, and I hate those non-skippable skippable videos. Anyway, today's guest is Roxanne Petraeus, CEO and co-founder of Athena. It's a compliance training software startup, and one of her early investors, Hunter Walk from Homebrew, is joining us as well. But we're not talking about compliance training today. Instead, we're talking about underserved markets and fundraising off vision instead of metrics. And this is helpful for early stage startups all the way to anybody selling anything. Then following the chat, we're going to have several startups pitch and pitch practice where they'll have two minutes to present their company. And then they'll get four minutes of feedback from the three of us on their pitch and storytelling the like. Announcements. Now, I just have one announcement, but it's a three-parter. Uh, we have several large pitch competitions on the horizon, and you need to apply for them. To apply, you go to apply.techcrunch.com. On September 7th, I'm hosting a special TechCrunch Live in Minneapolis, and we're looking for Minneapolis-based startups to pitch at that, that event. And the winner gets free exhibition space at TechCrunch Disrupt in October. Then in November and December, TechCrunch is hosting one-day events on crypto and on space. These opportunities are open to everyone, but you need to pitch in person in Miami for crypto and LA for space. Once again, the URL for that is apply techcrunch.com or you can just google startup battlefield apply it's all the same form so with that being said my announcement's out of the way let's bring on hunter and roxanne and uh, get this thing going hunter how, how are you doing great i'm curious where you go if you're at the intersection of space and crypto man that's you apply for both somewhere atmospheric level <laughs> that's right yeah that's right oh. roxanne how are you um, I'm just like a little concerned the quality of jokes. It's just, it's only up from here. Um, but otherwise I'm good. I also want to call out that the compliance training that you were talking about wasn't Athena's compliance training, which is excellent. Just as a quick, uh, I think that, slide. I think that's totally fair. That's a, that's a fair <laughs> disclosure, but yeah. let's start with that. I mean, why start a compliance training software company? Yeah, I think, um, Basically, I took a lot of really bad training. Um, it was an idea that had been percolating for a long time and then kind of had a quick catalyst. The percolation was, was in the Army as an active duty Army officer for about seven years. And about once a year, I'd pack into an auditorium, someone would talk at like the whole you know org. And it felt like a joke, like the time would have been better spent just doing literally anything else. And I just thought that was strange. I left the military and went to McKinsey, which has you know, generally quite good um, learning, corporate training, et cetera. And then I found myself, like you just described, kind of clicking next and sending mm -hmm. emails. And I was really surprised because I had thought that kind of dumb check the box training was a quirk of the government. And so when I saw that it wasn't, I talked to, among other folks, someone in the insurance practice, he explained the why and essentially said, like, you should just leave and go start this company. There's... Um, it to to the uh, title of this talk. It's a really overlooked space. It's boring. Nothing has happened since the '90s. Um, so yeah, that was kind of the long and short of it. Everything is being reinvented right now. But why do you think compliance training really has not? Yeah, I, until now. Um, until now. So so I think a lot about timing and. Um, my co-founder, Ann, and I started this company after Me Too and right when regulations were going into effect in New York and California to start, they required essentially every company to start training on uh, specifically sexual harassment prevention training. That's the first um, topic that we tackled. And so I think that like historically, there wasn't really an impetus to do things better. Like, yeah, it was bad, but it checked a box. And what the world required of companies was to check a box. 
And then the world changed and we had um, an offering that like spoke to exactly that moment. The world then changed again a couple months later with COVID and the need for a software solution uh, that uh, could navigate the multi-state regulatory environment. So you move from California to New York, anything like that, suddenly um, software becomes crucial in order to, to make that all very seamless. And so I think the first trend we saw and the second trend, we just sort of got lucky as it were. But I mean, both I think really speak to the importance of timing in companies and, and being able to ride a wave instead of try to create a wave. Yeah. Now, Hunter, let's bring you in here. Not not every company can be boom supersonic and, and build mm-hmm. supersonic jets. And it seems like you've invested in a lot of these these underlying technology companies. Why invest in something like, like Athena? Yeah, absolutely. We love... Um... Places where software can change, evolve, improve uh, something that existed before the personal computer ever existed. So we've made Mm -hmm. lots of investments in um, areas like Athena, but even broader, you know, sort of construction, agriculture, um, industries that, you know, I guess you go back 10 years ago and you sort of have this question of, well, you know, are they ready to change? Um, and now I think the question is, is yes, for so many, so many reasons. Um, what struck us with Athena about why it was, you know, interesting ultimately um, wasn't, wasn't sort of the, the TAM. You know, a lot of times people will come and they'll sort of pitch a TAM, total addressable market, to tell you what the value of this business could be um, mm-hmm. from a revenue standpoint. And what's interesting, I find, in some of the uh, businesses like Athena is a lot of money is being spent on the problem today but most of it is actually not previously being spent on software. It's being spent on trainers, being spent on um, salaries. Uh, So it's sort of a tough market to to quantify in some ways, or at least if you're looking at it and saying, you know, oh, this is how much people are spending on analogous solutions, you're probably underestimating the size of the market. And so instead we look and we ask ourselves, is this market large? Is this market urgent and is this market valuable, urgent for its customer? I think when we first met um, Roxanne and her co-founder and heard of, heard their story, uh, we were convinced pretty quickly about size, large, you know, basically when you think you have, you know, legally required, um, you know, and mandated, yeah. that sort of becomes an, an, a nice market pressure. I think where we sort of, you know, debated a little bit internally, and we could talk more about this, was sort of like, value and and urgency value on was this going to be changing from something that was a checkbox um hey it's not broken don't fix it you know to something where wow there's a bunch of reasons that we have to do something better here um from a company perspective and then the urgency you know uh uh again uh assuming the value again like and and would they pay for that you know sort of sure. if they were being compelled to do it um is it something where you want to sort of find the cheapest solution available because it, like you said, it's a bunch of click boxes and then we can just, you know, sort of, uh, you know, CYA ourselves until we have to do it again a year from now, or, you know, would people actually be interested in doing something better than, you know, sort of the minimum viable product? Um, not because you can't build, you know, a highly profitable, you know, very interesting business here on sort of a low cost product, but I get most excited when you sort of can deliver a high quality product at a fair price. I think that's like a very su- interesting sweet spot for SaaS tools. Um, and so that's sort of how we thought about, you know, the opportunity aside from, you know, the uh, then looking at the team itself and saying, are these the right people to build this product, to build this company? Now I'm going to do a little foreshadowing here. Yesterday, Hunter and I and, and Roxanne talked and, and, and Hunter revealed that, uh, what did you say? <laughs> the exact quote is they pitched us the business and not the vision. So that's kind of the overall theme here. Um, and I'm hoping we can bring up the first slide, which is we're going to do a shortened version of, of Athena's slide deck. Let's talk through this slide, and then we'll talk about why you didn't invest fully. Mm-hmm. So, Roxanne, to you, can you explain this slide to us? Yeah, so I think um, here we were explaining the problem. I think the slide itself and the idea of explaining the problem was probably important. I think everyone had taken, or like most people had taken training. So they get the initial problem, which is like, I hate it. You know, as an employee, this is insulting, but kind of to Hunter's point, like that alone wouldn't say that a company is going to invest more money in it. Like they may not, you know, care. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I think that something that we could have done a better job of then, and certainly like since then have learned a lot on 
is um, like the second, um, or, or the reasons that matter to the buyer. So the employee is not the actual buyer of our, of our training. It's a centralized buyer, typically legal or HR, depending on how big the company is. And yes, they don't like that they that employees hate it. This is like a very known problem. They get, um, but what, yes. but there's like um, more specific reasons that to Hunter's point could then help an investor explain. Oh, I would pay money for that. So I just got off of a QBR with one of our enterprise customers, and they had shown all of the ways that we've saved them. It was something like you know four ish hours a week um, on administering training because what they used to do is a bunch of CSVs, make sure that people in California got acts, the anti bribery training did that go to the right you know part of the sales team, whatever. There's all this manual work, and you can then just um, you know put a dollar value to that, right? Like you're spending mm-hmm. X number of hours. Um, on this other thing. And now with just our HRIS um, integration, like a work day or whatever alone, we save that amount. And then you can go to like, well, how much does it spend? Um, how often does your people team deal with complaints? And you say like, oh, actually all the time, like often our harassment prevention training gets a lot of complaints about just how uh, um, bad, for lack of a better word, it is. And you can say like, <laughs> yeah. okay, well, would you rather be doing that kind of work? Or would you rather have your people team, for example, thinking about retention or whatever? And so I guess I, I think that like, if I had to grade it, be like B for the slide, like we we were right to explain the problem, though obviously would love Hunter's thoughts, but I don't think we exactly explain the problem in a way that w- an investor would understand like, oh, a company would put a lot of dollars behind that. Hunter? Yeah, I think that's fair. You know, the way that I sometimes think about it is I want the fa- I want to believe that the founders picked a problem that if they solve that problem, the company can't help but be extraordinarily valuable, extraordinarily valuable. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I just have to judge like, okay, you know, are they, is this a real problem? Are they going to solve it? You know, that type of thing. And I remember, you know, what I came away thinking was, oh, like, yeah, there's like, there's some customers for this. This is not, you know, this is not going to be a dud. Um, but you know, if they solve this in the way that I was translating what a solution looked like, again, you know, sort of too narrow in my mind, you know, sort of uh, I didn't fully understand um, what this company could be. But you know, sort of imagining, sort of like, oh yeah, this company, if they do what they said they could do, I could really easily see this being, you know, quote unquote, just you know, a fifty million to two hundred fifty million dollar company, and um, you know, properly not overly capitalized. That could be a really great outcome for a lot of different types of investors, or so on and so forth. But like, given my opportunity cost of only making so many investments per year, um, is this one that I'm going to you know sort of double down on, so to speak? Mm-hmm. And I think that's where you know early on, you know, besides you know who could have anticipated you know. Um, the acceleration of the need here, you know, based upon COVID and remote working and hybrid and all this stuff. I mean, I think there's a bunch of factors um, that, you know, uh, if you're doing the right thing, you know, sort of those ended up being accelerants. Um, this company would have been fine, you know, without those. Um, but I, I think that probably where I couldn't cross the chasm, so to speak, was the question about is this problem, if fully solved, valuable enough to build a really valuable company. And that's where I was probably, you know, trying to push a little bit, trying to conceive of in my mind and, and, you know, got to in some ways the wrong answer initially. I knew I wanted to be in business with this team. Um, uh, but I sort of, you know, held back a little bit, you know, wrote a supporting check, started to get a better sense of them as opposed to committing, you know, all in from day one. Yeah. And, and you seem to be throwing money at them now. You've invested the last two I, rounds. Every time they give me an opportunity, I, I write a check, I think increasingly large for um, an increasingly smaller piece of the company, which is sort of what happens when an investor is, you know, never quite owns as much of the company as they'd like. Um, fortunately, I think I've uh, lived up to the other half of the promise I made when I wrote them the first check, when Satya and I wrote them the first check, which was, you know, uh, uh, per per percentage of ownership, I'm going to be more valuable than anybody else. So I'm trying trying to do that. But absolutely, I mean, I think, the problem with companies that succeed for investors like myself is um, my best shot was that first shot. And now all I'm doing is, you know, incrementally trying to trying to get some more, um, but I'll never own as much as I could have if I had made the right decision initially. What, what was the cause of concern at the beginning? Um, well, so, you know, I talked a little bit about this question about market and like it wasn't fully convicted on, on market. Um, and the other thing, I, I it felt like a very special team. You know, I, I, in preparing for this, I had shared, um, you know, I was, I was going back through my emails and and 
uh, shared with Roxanne um, my initial comments back to the person who introduced us. Oh, could you share with us too? Yeah, I think the short version was, you know, wow, this feels like a really special, interesting team that I'd like to be like, for, like that I'd like to be in business with, and probably would be like really, really enjoy, you know, you know, working to support, and that like proved to be true. Um, but I also then, you know, sort of remember the conversation that Sacha and I were having because we make decisions together and by consensus. And you know, sometimes as an investor, you sort of are biased by you know, there's a recency bias, like experiences mm. that you've recently had favor you, you know, to one path or another. And I think we had probably at the time, you know, this is what early 2020, maybe um, had come off um, or had been in a part of the portfolio where we saw some enterprise startups that had really, really smart, wonderful mission-driven founders, but didn't necessarily have the go-to-market um, skill on that founding team. So, you know, uh, uh, smart founders, maybe uh, technical or product, but hadn't yet done, hadn't sold into the enterprise. Um, and I remember feeling a little bit gun shy, um, saying like, okay, I'm comfortable with, uh, and, you know, Roxanne's founder, um, you know, has the product engineering chops and wow, like Roxanne's background screams leadership, screams capable, screams, you know, yeah. uh, very, very smart. Um, but didn't we just, you know, to, to my partner, but didn't we just say like, we weren't going to continue, like we weren't going to make this mistake again, you know? Um, uh, so I think that was sort of it. And I was like, but there's something here. I, I'm just, you know. Like, I know we said that, but there's something here, like I can't totally let this go. And so what, you know, our, our, our business previously was making about 10 to 12 core investments a year where we're trying to really sort of, you know, uh, uh, write as much as we can. But then alongside of that, um, very successfully, you know, we had also made some smaller checks if for some reason um, we couldn't insist that we were the best investor for them. Um, and so we said, hey, take somebody else's money, but take smaller money from ours. Or if there was just some circumstance where um, we otherwise, you know, uh, uh, weren't ready to commit sort of a million to $2 million. Um, and so, you know, I, I made that offer in this case. Sometimes it can be a little bit awkward because I'm sort of saying, hey, I know you're pitching me <laughs> to do this. Um, I'm not going to get there on that. But, you know, can you take a smaller check for me? I promise I'll work hard for you. I promise it won't be negative signaling. You know, um, I promise I won't, you know, won't be a mm -hmm. distraction. And so, you know, it's always up to the founder at the end of the day, whether they're, they're going to buy into that or not. But I think from my side, at least like that was the, you know, the, what, instead of getting to yes, that was like the getting to maybe. <laughs> yes. Yes. Let, let's pull up the next slide, slide four. Great. Now, now, Roxanne, while that's sitting there, I'm just hoping you could revisit what, what Hunter just said. Why do, why do you think perhaps you didn't fully sell him on, on the first round? Yeah. Well, and I must say that um, Hunter has been true to um, his word, like um, incredible investor, um, like, uh, yeah, just um, recommend without reservations. Um, but I think um, it's something I think about when I'm hiring, for example. So like sometimes you interview a candidate and you're like, I need you to do X and you just did X a couple of times. Great. Other times, like there's sometimes a pro um like the experience is a proxy for what you really want, which is like the expertise or the the raw talent that would tell you this person can do the thing here. And so I like totally agree. I had um, really like no sales experience uh, and no marketing experience. What's kind of interesting is I think there are some proxies that like I didn't see at the time that would have said, well, I'll, pr I'll probably be pretty good at this, which are even things like, I mean, it was after the fact, but Hunter, I'm thinking, I think you said like, whatever, I'll put in 50K or something. And I was like, 100 and it's like, even that is like what you need for sales to just be like, I see that, but I'm, I'm going to take no as you meant. Yes. And like, let's just try for that. Or, um, it's something I've written about. I have a newsletter, people person. And I don't think that women founders are encouraged to talk about previous failures because there's a lot of research that I'm um, sure the internet will um, tell me it's incorrect. It's not, <laughs> um, that basically says like women are judged by past expertise and performance and like men are often judged by potential. And so I say that all to say, I had actually been a founder before I had bootstrapped a company. When you bootstrap a company, like you gotta be really good at either sales or marketing because that's the only money that's coming into the business. But I didn't, I, I can't remember Hunter, if you remember, but I don't think I talked about that in any of my early pitches because I was almost like, well, it wasn't, you know, a, a huge, um, like win, uh, you know, and takes company public. And so I don't want investors to think that that's what I'm going to do again. And it's very funny because I think, or not funny, um, but, uh, I hear the narrative a lot for men investor, uh, excuse me, men founders, like they've got a chip on their shoulder and that's why I want to invest. Cause I can see that they're like pissed and hungry and they're going to win. 
And for some reason, I thought that what I needed to convey was sort of perfection or like, yeah, I'm really good and all of these um, things and actually not talk about um, maybe like the drive or um, areas that I stumbled, but then what I learned from that. Yeah. Where, where does the vision come into pitching? So I think the vision uh, comes into pitching because like, yeah, Hunter had said I was, I pitched the business, but not the vision. And I think I didn't really understand the difference at the time, especially so early stage. I'm like, I don't know, we got this thing and it's, it's kind of working a little bit. And what I didn't explain was like, what, if it, if it goes right in 10 years, like what the impact will, will be and not from a product perspective, like it'll have these features and it'll do this stuff, but more like, so when we think of what compliance training is really about, it's actually really about culture, right? Like are people, do people know what mm. the right thing is and do they do the right thing? And that's often, you know, everything from, do they have managers who know how to um, hold them accountable is leadership and tone at the top, right? And when you take away the word compliance and you talk about culture and getting things right and, and all of that, suddenly you're like, oh, that is a huge, you know, iconic, like enduring business. If someone could get that right, I, I talk with CEOs a lot and I say like, Biggest fear is I look at a bunch of Zoom squares and I've got no idea what's going on in my company. And so then there are a bunch of examples to Hunter's point. Often a lot of them are employee spend, sneaky dollars, consultants, things like that, that try to get at this problem. But what we were doing is building a wedge to that problem. But I talked a lot about the wedge and I didn't talk about like, if we get this wedge in the door, here's where we're going. Here's our big ambitious vision. And I, I think I just didn't appreciate that at the seed level, that was crucial because it's not a metrics based raise because there's, you know, so few metrics. Right. So can you talk us through slide four here then? Yeah. So here, I think we talked about um, what we tried to do is talk about the impact, um, like from a dollars perspective and trends um, that, that were at our, um, that would be propelling the business. I think that we did an okay job here. And I think like, you know, this was post me too. like Hunter certainly got like why it's really bad if companies have um, like pervasive issues, you know, mm -hmm. news. Um, I think that what we could have done a better job of is like explaining again, why those dollars like really matter to companies, why, why that ties into the vision, how they're spending again, sneakily on all of these other things to get at like the root cause of this issue, which is sort of a culture one. Um, and instead just being like compliance training, like it, I, I think that, um, I don't know if Hunter, you would agree, but you were like, yes, I see those trends. I don't see how those trends make you, you know, a billion plus dollar business. Yeah. It would, I think it goes back to sort of, you know, uh, you know, what I said earlier and what, what, what sort of the way Roxanne explains it, which is, you know, the, um, of course, this is becoming more important. And of course, you know, um, uh, the legal environment has changed in a few different ways, both the cost of messing this up, as well as the um, expanding the market through, you know, who should, who needs to offer this to their, um, to their team. Um, but it was unclear that, you know, those would immediately equal uh, a unique position for right. Athena versus, you know, other software providers, you know, other L and D channels, that type of stuff. And, you know, I sort of like the, we're going to do this and let me, and then like, but if we do, you know, I like what I sometimes call iceberg companies, which is, um, what I'm showing you is the 10% above the surface. Um, you know, but I also want to sort of give you a little bit of a secret, which is let's peek below the surface and let me show you the other 90% that we're actually building if we can get this right. You know, what, people what, who let just- Let me pause you right yeah. there, Hunter. What, what do you want to see underneath the surface specifically? I sort of, I want to see a little bit of like why this is the wedge, why this is the wedge to a bigger vision, what being successful in this first um, phase, why it's connected to an increased probability of the other 90% working, right? Sometimes that could be because this is the right buyer for these other things. If we build that mm -hmm. relationship, it's going to be more easier to upsell, cross-sell. Sometimes it's because um, the data we're getting here can be leveraged in a very interesting, unique way that actually then makes, you know, the other product SKUs better than somebody who's doing a pure play, but that can be, you know, sort of things like that. If all I'm getting is some hand wavy vision about, you know, change the world, we're going to be a culture vehicle for blah, 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 but you're not telling me like how you're going to build anything. That's not interesting to me either. I mean, maybe that'll work on certain VCs. I, you know, if, if, if either way, I'd rather always err towards, um, hey, I've got some stake. I'm still trying to figure out the sizzle more so than somebody who is, you know, mono, you know, famous Simpsons episode, like doing the monorail song. Um, but, um, you know, but 
when 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 the magic really occurs for me, you know, it's sort of the intersection of two. You know, I, and look, I love what we've been talking about. You know, for the last 20, 25 minutes, we're going to talk a little bit more. I just also want to emphasize that, like, um, despite us sort of like ripping apart, tearing down what worked, what didn't work, what they, <laughs> like, they raised a great round, and then they raised a few more. Like in two mm -hmm. years, you know, they just raised their 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 Series B, and everything has been kind of you know the sort of proverbial up and to the right, um, even you know ahead of and into a, a, a quote unquote market correction. I think it's interesting, um, you know, and, and I just want to make sure we get this in that like everybody who invests ends up like they've of course brought new investors on. But each round has been, I think, is it fair to say that each round has been led by somebody who knew you prior to the fundraiser was on the cap table? I think that's, I think that's right, that we've seen like someone would try to lead A and then it didn't work out, but then they would lead the B and they would do a small check-in. And then the same with like super pro rata. And it's um, an interesting thing that Ann and I thought about, and I think I've gotten better, you know, or I have gotten better each time at, at pitching because now I sort of understand like what... Um, what what they're looking what investors are looking right. for but we have definitely found that we're sort of a team where um as soon as you see back channels of investors who um <laughs> are giving references about us and they'll say things like they're really sneaky operators and they'll like explain that like they don't oh. come in with bravado saying like i'm gonna change the world and you know <laughs> um, i wanted to say like crypto and rocket ships which is what you just said um like that's not that's just never the the natural like type of um founder that i am and certainly um my um cto uh co-founder is but what we are like really really good at is execution and so it's just an interesting thing to think about for founders who sort of feel like they have to put on a persona and i think hunter has pushed me to say it's not a persona it's like taking what's in your head and making sure that an investor can understand it which it feels much better because it never like you know it never feels good if you feel like you're having to put on an act but I, I think that there's just like definitely something there of founders who it's not their natural inclination and instead they're a little bit more like under promise and over deliver but unfortunately if you are that type like sometimes you're not going to get the seed round to be able to do that and so like it's a it's a really important skill that i think i um I just didn't understand exactly what investors were looking for. What's interesting is like really good investors. I think like even no matter, I talked with our pre-seed investor, Ali Pertovi of, of Neo. And I was like, was my pitch good? And he was like, I don't remember it, probably bad. And I was like, yeah, I, I bet it was bad. But he was looking, he knew my co-founder really well and he knew me in, enough. So it's, it's. Um, I think it, it that context certainly helps. Yeah. And, yeah. and what's interesting is I know, you know, we've talked about this in the terms of slide deck in our relationship, but like, Roxanne and 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 Anne as well, but Roxanne, you know, for purposes of this conversation, has always been, I think, has always been great at selling the vision to employees and customers. Um, yeah. Like investors, for some reason, was this weird thing at the beginning, oh, it's so right? True. Um, yeah. Because they they've punched above their weight on hiring uh, often passive candidates, like people who actually have to understand not just that this next year is going to be exciting, but you know. Uh, you know that this could be a you know, transformative company for their career as well. So I often I often see that like obviously there's people who are just bad at selling in general, but then there's people who sort of um, are great talking about their business, you know, to customers, great talking about their business to um, uh, potential employees, employees, but like you know sort of don't think of investors in the same way of like I need to understand this, I need to crack you know them as a sales channel, um, you know. Totally. And, uh, and especially early on ahead of data, like it's, you know, mostly sales, you know, later on, you just give the spreadsheets and, you know, the, the people crunch the numbers, but like, you know, I think it was just the two of you. I don't remember if you had any employees at the time, you know, type of thing, um, when we were getting started. And so I'm just trying to figure out, you know, Hey, are we going to spend, you know, is this somebody that I can spend a decade with? And, you know, of course, economic mm -hmm. returns so and so forth, but like, are they going to build something, you know, that we're all going to be really proud of? Well, Hunter, Hunter, how how important is that first pitch? You know, it's obviously first impressions always important, so on and so forth. I, I think during the phase of time that we're referring back to, you know, sort of Q1 2020, um, it was it was even more important. Maybe we're at like a local, you know, like a local maxima for. Oh, interesting. Everything was moving very quickly. A lot of deal flow, a lot of volume, a lot of velocity. I had to make very tough decisions, you know, all along the top of funnel because, you know, you only have so much time. We're a you know small firm and founders as well. You know, um, obviously, you know, not a, it, there's people who are like, I took one meeting and I got millions of dollars, and there's people who you know sort of had longer fundraises. But but regardless, 
um, there were a lot of people wanting to talk to everybody and a lot of rounds moving very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so I sort of think back and like, you know, again, seed market is still pretty healthy, so on and so forth. But like, if, if Roxanne and I were having this conversation, you know, an initial conversation now during a little bit more of a, of a, of an economic downturn and stuff and so forth, like, would I have had more time on my end to sort of take a first or second bite at the apple and, mm -hmm. you know, over the course of a few weeks, get to know them in a, in a way that actually would have gotten me to, um, you know, put, put a, uh, you know, an additional zero on the check or something like that. I, and, you know, I don't know if it would have helped them or not, but it would have made me, you know, would have made me in retrospect a lot happier. <laughs> That's great. Well, we have two more slides to get through in about five minutes. So I want to jump to slide number seven. I think it's a very interesting slide for a couple of reasons. One, I, I like that you're showing what the pilot is and you gave some numbers there and you're showing where you're going. So Roxanne, can you talk us through this one? Yeah, so I think this is like, you know, the, the traction slide and we were maybe like a five month old company. So in some ways there's never going to be a ton of traction, but what I didn't appreciate at the time, and I think it's because my first company was um, B2C. And so I thought our numbers, I'm like, I don't know, they're good, but not amazing. Turns out they were like very strong for B2B, but I didn't understand that. Um, like we had our first eight companies within a month of starting. And that just speaks to the fact that they were all like in New York, needed to train. We were like, we just started training and they're like, great, cool. Um, and so, yeah, so I think that like that was um, that was a very uh, huge advantage that we had. I don't think I made the most of it, but I, I think to Hunter's point, like um, when I talked to customers, I was like, I got this idea. And they were like, I literally thought someone would have come along for years and made this. Um, like our buyers just totally got it. So I have the um, paid pilot out of Fang Company. And, um, and that was from, I think that was uh, Netflix, like one of our early enterprise customers, been incredible customers to date. Um, we train Zendesk, like huge, you know, Zoom, all of it. Um, mm -hmm. Really, really strong um, customers. And we were talking to them from our earliest days. And um, Hunter's point really resonates that that never felt like sales to me. It felt like I was explaining to them the solution and they were like, please may I have this yesterday, even though, you know, the tech wasn't built out yet. It was very V1. And I, I think I just didn't appreciate how um, special that was to investors and sort of undersold it. And something else I got a lot of feedback on later is like everyone says that they've got a, you know, pilot at a fang. Um, and what I wasn't explaining is it was like, it's the whole company. We're compliance training. So I didn't get five people at a large organization to buy and try my thing. What we were doing is getting the entire organization, CEO down to new hire for all of the customers companies that we were bringing on. And so, yeah, I think it was maybe just a, um, I didn't realize just how much I, I could um, explain this traction and this magic to um, to investors, but even just like numbers alone, at least for the the time were considered quite strong. Yeah, absolutely. My two, my two takeaways were like from a slide like this was on the pilot side, I was sort of like, great, this ra this raises the floor, but I'm not sure it raises the, the ceiling, right? My concern yeah. about, oh yeah, they're gonna like, this is gonna, they're gonna, this is gonna work. Like they're gonna make a company that's worth between X and Y most probability. And like, that's gonna be great for them, but I'd like, do I see the upside from here? And so, you know, I had all the same questions of like, awesome. Like, are these just early adopters who really care about this as a culture issue? Like, how do I know this is indicative of a larger market? The, the stat on the left, the pilot, like that's the, you know, a version of sort of now the like now famous superhuman, you know, sort of stat of like, you know, right. how, how disappointed we be. And like, obviously it speaks again, in this case, it actually was sort of a canary in the cage. It spoke to, and I think that number is probably held up or even increased as this company has scaled dramatically. But I remember like every deck I, you know, every deck picks something like this to tell me, you know, yeah. our customers are satisfied. And, and like, so, so I sort of go blind to those things. And I also sort of in the back of my head, when people show me a stat like this, I'm like, yeah, but like what made the special was, you know, that like, these smart people at Superhuman understood that this was like the true KP, this was a true North metric for their product. Right. Like just every company then just asking that question is like, yeah. okay, like fine. Like, you know, 81% is better than 25%, but if it was 25%, you wouldn't show it to me, you know? So, you know, yeah. it's, you know, like for me, I sort of go blind to like that type of stuff, but like, again, you know, it was sort of two different ways of seeing, you know, like pilot data, so on and so forth. Like the fact that they built something or out there told me that this was going to be a company. Like the majority of companies I see sometimes feel like this will be a company if investors back this. This was not that. This was, this is going to be a company. Um, we are going to raise this money. Um, would you like to be a part of it? You know, and you know, my answer ended up being, you know, yes, kind of. <laughs> yes, kind of. Well, we're running out of time. I have to go to pitch practice. So Roxanne, I'm going to give you the last one though. You told me yesterday that you, your pitching abilities evolved over time. 
I'm hoping you can give all the entrepreneurs a little little quick tips on, on the way out here. What would you advise them when they pitch to advisor or investors rather? Yeah, I think one um, one thing I've learned is understand where you don't pattern match, um, and then figure out how you're going to tell that story. So what I mean by that, for example, like Hunter's um, point, like definitely other investors saw it, which is I didn't have go to market expertise in the traditional sense. I wasn't like you know I ran growth at Notion. And everyone's like take my money. Um, and instead I had other things and what I should have been doing is explaining how like those, um, other sort of non-traditional experiences actually were exactly what you would want, um, out of someone who had growth experience, um, or saying like, no, I don't have it, but look, I've been selling this thing for three months and like, seems like either I'm good or the product's good, but regardless, like who cares? Um, so I would, I would advise founders to just understand everyone has like a weakness or a perceived weakness in terms of how investors are going to evaluate your background. And at the seed stage, they're really backing you. So taking the time to like know yourself, um, in the eyes of investors, I think is a really powerful exercise. Yeah, oh, the that's last, great. Hold on. The last word has to include, um, just letting people know what the product offerings are today and how they're Oh my goodness, who's good at sales, Hunter or Roxanne? <laughs> Everyone who's listening, if they are a company, should have compliance training. Athena, goathena.com has compliance training. Not I just for it. sexual harassment, for all different types. Oh, you're looking for and they're short little bites too, right? Digestible over time. People like it a lot. <laughs> That's great. Well, I'm glad you got that in there because it is a neat concept. <laughs> I, I would much rather do that than watch a video for two hours. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. That's the idea. People like it. <laughs> yes. Well, both of you, thank you so much for that last 35 minutes, but we're going to go to pitch practice now. And this is where we bring on entrepreneurs that are watching live and they pitch to us and they have two minutes to do so. Then afterwards, we'll give them four minutes of feedback on their storytelling and, and how, how they pitch. So the first one we're bringing on is Mary. And Mary is the co-founder and COO of June. It's either June or June. I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but I'm hoping... Mary is on the line with us. If you can turn on your camera and your microphone. Not seeing you there. Julio, are we good to go? Okay, well, let's move to the second one there. Nikita. Nikita from Hey Everyone. Everyone. Are we there? Oh, Mary, Mary says she's on now. This is the, the fun part of doing things live. I have to click through everything and narrate while I'm doing it. All right, Mary, there you are. I see you now. Sorry about that. I was just sitting in the audience as a watcher. Didn't realize I needed to That's be okay. promoted. Um, no worries. No worries at all. Well, you have two minutes to present your company, and we're going to start the timer now. Hi, I'm Mary. I'm the co-founder of Juni. We are providing reusable packaging as a service for food systems. In the last 50 years, single-use packaging has been artificially cheap, which is why it's everywhere. But this is already changing. Packaging prices have doubled in the last year due to increased cost of shipping and global supply chain disruptions. And this will only get worse over the next 10 years because of climate change effects. There's an obvious solution, which is reusable packaging. Obviously, we didn't invent reusable packaging recently. Tupperware has been around for many decades. But Food operators won't simply buy reusable packaging and wash on site because it's too much to manage and most don't have the space, time, or equipment. That's where Genie comes in. We're helping closed systems transition to reuse. We work with canteens, offices, and food markets and focus on the reverse logistics of reusable packaging. If you can't wash it on site, that means we have to bring it off site and we're focused on building the logistics and technology behind making that happen. Before starting Juni, I led the packaging and logistics teams at HelloFresh and helped to build a logistics network to ship fresh food across the US. And Juni is backed by the CEO of HelloFresh US, my former boss. Since signing on our first paying client in February of this year, we've seen 81% month over month growth, expected to hit 40,000 items per month by the end of this year. Demand for reuse will continue to grow as legislation, consumer sentiment, and pricing makes buying single use items clearly the unsustainable choice. We're raising a pre-seed round to build the operating model to make reuse possible at scale with London as our MVP. Our vision is to connect the demand for reuse with the service providers who can enable the world to ditch single use for good. Very good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. And I would love for something like that, but for my kids and all the disposable stuff I send to school. So if they can just drop the stuff at school and not bring it home because they don't do that already. 
you're 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 smiling. All right, let's get, let's go to to Hunter. Yeah. Hunter, any feedback? Hi, thanks so much for giving that. Yeah. Um. So the first thing is, I really appreciated in uh, that your sort of uh, uh, the case for urgency, the the business use case wasn't just you know people wanting to do the right thing, but a set of like sort of market trends and drivers that you know sort of are strategic in addition in addition to sort of ethical. Um. So that you know you gave me a sense of the the why now. Um. Uh, what I'd love a little bit of a better sense of are, are two things that involve kind of the, the business itself. One, um, you know, and it may differ based on customers, but, you know, who, who's who's the decision maker for this? So, you know, um, I want to know that, like, there's actually a champion that who's, you know, you can target who's going to make this decision and and this helps them achieve, you know, sort of their business goals. Um, so I always think like you have to be one of the three most important things um, in your customer's mind for them to want to pay attention to you. They have too many things. So I could imagine, you know, without sort of forming that, I'm sort of like, okay, great, of course, like you get a lot of first meetings, but then who has to agree to this and what other things does it have to, does it end up changing within a company, workflows, processes, where people are just like, ah, this is great, but like, you know, uh, we'll make it a 2024, you know, sort of item to think about. And the second thing is, you know, sort of, it doesn't have to be like a true, like sort of, you know, oh, our average customer value is X, it's early, but, you know, sometimes the, you know, if we can, you know, once we sell to, you know, our, you know, first 50 customers or, you know, 2% market penetration where an X, you know, X million dollars of revenue or something like that, just something to give me a little bit of sense of scale of, you know, sort of how many, how many customers you have to sign up to start to show some meaningful, meaningful traction? Is this something that's going to be about big whale hunting, you know, and like 10 gets us to X, or is it, you know, a much more fragmented distributed uh, business where you're going to have to sort of, you know, fight company by company um, to sort of build a revenue stack? I think that's great. Okay. Roxanne, anything from you? Yeah, um, I thought you did a great job kind of uh, answering or proactively answering the team and why you and um, like uh, to the what we were talking about earlier, not like, boy, do you know anything about packaging? Like, it, it seems like you're kind of a logical person to to do this. And then same point with Hunter on timing, like I kind of got a sense of um, a more detailed sense of regulations and not just like consumers care about stuff now, um, like millennials, you know, that kind of hand wavy thing. I thought that where, um, similar to issues I had at the early stage where I didn't walk away being like, I see the really big vision. So I got like, okay, replace packaging, but I guess I wasn't sure like would it, you know, if I, if I would maybe encourage you to do the exercise of if we get this right, what next? And if we get that right, what next? And like, just see where you land, where you still feel comfortable. And is it like a huge logistics player? Is it um, actually expanding into other types of food? I, I, haven't, um, I, I don't know, but I think the point is being able to see the like really big vision takes it from to just put like a business to kind of more of a, a venture backed um, business. Yeah, but I thought she did a great job. Yeah, me too. All right. Very, very good, Mary. Thank you so much for joining. Please apply, apply again. We'll have you pitch again. Thank you. All right. Bye now. Okay. Next up, we have Nikita. I believe that's how you pronounce it from Hey Everyone. And you should be on the line. I see you. If you can turn on your camera and your mic. There you are. Yeah, hey there. Matt, how are you? Hunter, thanks for having me. All right. Well, you have two minutes to present. Hey, everyone. Hey, hey everyone. My name is Nikita, and I'm the founder of Hey, Everyone. Um, as a second-time founder, I know how important investor updates are. But I also know that it takes founders up to 600 hours a year to remember what happened this month, scrape data from employees, third-party tools, describe that data with text, format it, and send it out. And when it comes to potential investors, it gets even worse. Founders don't even get a shot. At Hey Everyone, we help founders create email updates investors wait for in seconds. Data reach, right on time, always in the bullseye. All thanks to AI, machine learning, and quite a few integrations. Using our web app email constructor, founders update their current investors and warm up their potential ones, hassle-free. The investment updates market is valued at $2 billion a year, but our product is not limited to be used by only by startups. Enterprise reporting will become our next step. And this market is projected to reach 24 billion by 2028. In my previous startup, which was ranking number four social app on the app store in 2020, I have personally crafted more than 300 updates, 
spend over a thousand man hours. And man, I bet my investors would be much more happy if I spent it on my product instead. So with Hey Everyone, we're guaranteeing that both founders and their investors will reach their goals much faster and spend more time on their products. We're launching our MVP this fall. And if you want to check out what we're up to, you're more than welcome to come see our website, heyeveryone.io. Thank you. Okay. Hunter, let's start with you since you're you're his target market. Um, yeah, well, I'm glad you, you know, clearly I've personally experienced the pain and suffering. And uh, and so I understand sort of the mission-driven nature of this. Um, I guess the biggest question in my mind would be sort of, um, you know, from a, a network effect standpoint, you know, sort of, is it about, you know, we're just going to, you know, open this up and hope people show up. We're going to start to, you know, sort of target the accelerators, incubators, so on and so forth, or we're going to go through the investor channels, you know, to be like, hey, your portfolio should be using this, not just because, you know, you save them time, but you'll get better structured data. We'll give you a dashboard view of like who hasn't sent them recently, you know, like all these sorts of things. And so maybe a little bit more, I have a sense of like, oh, this product feels like CRM-ish, you know, that type of thing, some things that are customized, something filled in. Um, I, you know, I'd love a little bit of sense of, um, you know, sort of uh, the different views of that data you get based upon, you know, whether you're a founder, whether you're an investor, whether you're a potential investor, and then sort of how you tip the market, you know, when people are, you know, doing something today that, you know, uh, uh, works well or doesn't work well for them, how do you get a behavior shift? Yeah, that's great. Roxanne? Thank you, Hunter. Um, yeah, so I think that um, you clearly like validated that you know a lot about this. I mean, saying I'm a second time founder, mistake I made. Um, uh, I think that in this space, investors will know a ton about this, right? It's like one of the few sort of things that like they'll be your main <laughs> expertise in, um, unlike, you know, if you're um, selling packaging or something. Uh, and so I feel like that could be a benefit and that investors get that like quality, for example, varies wildly, or you often hear that. Um, the whether founders just send investor updates kind of will tell you what type of founder they're going to be. So I feel like that would be the the pro of it. I mean, the con is that um, it could feel like a niche problem in some ways, unless you make the connection to like CRM or something like that. And I'm thinking of something like DocSend, where you know it's like a tool that's super important to founders for um, for fundraising, but um, I, I would just imagine that you'll get questions around like, is it, is this going to, is it really going to be built for purpose and built for a very like specific and passionate group of people, but like there really aren't that many founders, um, or, you know, um, ma making the leap really clear to the, the kind of next thing I think would be, um, important. Yeah. I'm going to double down on all that stuff that that's, that was my takeaway as well. I didn't really understand the product so much. And, and I really think that that needs to be driven home a little, a little harder. Yeah. Sometimes stuff like that, you can sort of be like, we're building business intelligence tools for founders, starting with, you know, the simplest, most common thing, which is email update or, you know, something like that. Um, you know, just sort of giving me a category that I know in and of itself could have value. And this is the first product in that category versus starting with a wedge where I'm sort of like, Okay, I get it. You know, there's a it's it's broad use case, but you know, um, does it have a, a a financial value with it that people will, will pay for? Yeah, that's a good way to put this. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much. And I got to ask you about that artwork behind you. Uh, what, what is it? The artwork? Oh, that's uh, that's just I'm 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 in Georgia right now, so that's uh, just a local picture. Nothing that's specific. The, that's the metaverse, yeah. Matt. That's the metaverse. Oh, I didn't know. Thanks yeah. for explaining that to me. No problem. Yeah, that's I great. I was born in the metaverse, actually. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's scary. All right. Well, thank you so much, Nikita. I, I really appreciate Bye. it. Free apply. Okay. We got one more, and he's ready to go already with Roga. All Hello. Right. Hello. Hey. How are you? Doing well. Thank you. Thank you for having yeah. me, Matt. Of course. Yeah. You will have two minutes to present Roga. Perfect. All right, everyone. My name is Ami. I'm the CEO and co-founder at Roga. Uh, Roga is a wearable plus an app duo. And we're focusing specifically on severe stress and burnout, and we're combining two proven methods. So we're combining non-invasive electrical brain stimulation and meditation into one safe, effective, and affordable solution. Uh, nationwide, stress is at the highest level. Uh, it's the critical time when it comes to mental health. CDC is showing, uh, actually last week, 43% of young Americans uh, reporting severe stress. 
I don't know if you saw it, John Oliver just did an episode highlighting how impossible it is to get mental health care last week. Yesterday, there were about 3,000 Kaiser mental health workers on strike because people are just not getting the help they need. So this is a combination of insane high cost, lack of providers, scary side effects from medication, time consuming processes that just makes making stress its own source of stress. Um, so this is a problem that is near to me, uh, to my heart. I worked 10 years at Google. I, I was the PM behind the Google Home and the Pixel phones, if you know those products. Um, and you know, after working a ton of hours and just burning out, um, I had to quit that that job and 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 focus on my mental health because I was in a dire situation. My co-founder, Dr. Allison Smith, she's a PhD in neuroscience. She worked her entire life on on creating this technology. And initially we built this for ourselves. Um, right now we've had so much success through our uh, reach out that we have 16,000 people waiting on the wait list. Um, that's, so we're, we're chasing our 6 million in sales this year and we're starting to fulfill the orders as fast as we can. This is easy to use. You can see it right now. I'm wearing it. It's concealable. It uses a gentle stimulation at a specific electrical frequency shown to reduce uh, brain activation with uh, associated with stress. 20 minutes a day can change the course of your life. So that's where we are. Um, if you're interested, please uh, have a look at brogalife.com. You can also download our app and see some of our cool content. Yeah, that's great. Uh, thank you very much for that. Roxanne, let's start with you. Any feedback? Yeah, I mean, obviously it seems like um, a really cool product. And I think that the when you were explaining the problem, I almost thought, I think everyone gets it at this point, whether you're either a company leader um, and you like recognize the cost or you're just uh, an individual and um, you you see it. So my suggestion there is I, I don't, I think that it's kind of been like burnout has been the word of, of COVID. And so you probably don't have to spend that much time explaining like the problem. And instead, I think it would have been neat to hear more on traction and go to market. So even like, is the idea just going to um, consumers individually? Is there kind of like a payer? um a thing or a anything around that just because i i felt that almost like the the problem was self-evident um and and like the amount of money in the space uh is the same you know i i'm just like aware that people um spend a, a lot on um solutions kind of like in the general vicinity i just would have loved to have he heard more about like your particular go-to-market um approach hypothesis um even if it's early yeah very good all right hunter um, yeah. So similarly, I, you know, I think some people will take different approaches to, to whether they want to bifurcate quickly the, their investor base into sort of interested, not interested, or sort of try to keep the funnel as wide as possible and then bring them along. Hardware is polarizing. Um, and so to the extent that like this is, you know, uh, an app that has, you know, a hardware upsell, um, uh, that would be one pitch to the extent that this is, um, hardware dependent, um, but obviously you have experience in that area. You're comfortable with it. You know it's 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 the efficacy. Then I would make the hardware a big part of it. You know and sort of de-risk the conversation around that early. Yeah. Um, I think if you sort of end up midway between the two, you'll get people who will um, was responsible like, wow, this sounds great. But you know whether they say it or not, they're like, I'm not really a hardware. They'll they'll, they'll see it as a hardware company and they'll say I'm not a hardware investor. Um, uh, and they may misjudge the complexity, cost, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, that's associated with the device itself. Um, and so just maybe a little bit on depending upon what the qualities and characteristics of that hardware are um, and who the target market is for it, uh, you know, sort of I'd almost turn the volume on that either up or down. But sort of mentioning it offhand, I think, puts you in sort of middle ground between um, two types of investors. Mm, thank you. It's good feedback. Yeah, thank you very much. That's really interesting. We're seeing a lot more hardware now that, that's dealing with stress. That's the first first wearable behind the ear. So yeah, I, yeah, I guess it has I just see level. Otherwise, people won't use it on public. Yeah, I guess I, I just have one question left here in this this minute we have left. But how do you ensure that that it it works, or how do you convey that it works to 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 users or investors? 
Yeah, so we've done uh, quite a lot of uh, user testing. Um, you can see it in our in our details in the science page. But essentially, if you use this for up to two weeks, you can get a reduction above fifty percent on anxiety symptoms, and after a month, of up to eighty percent. Um, and that's the the mean uh, of of all of it when when we look at all of the users that uh, but essentially you can also use it one time and and we have 95 percent of the users already seeing a benefit within one time use of 20 minutes um, so essentially it compounds over time but um, as, as as little as one session and we also give 30 day money get back guarantee so you can try it out well you seem nice and chill so i think it's working a little bit <laughs> thank you all right. Well, thank you so much. And as the company evolves, reapply and we'll have you back on too. Thank you. Have a great All day. All right. Well, Roxanne and, and Hunter, thank you for joining us today. I hope you had a great time. I know I did. I, I learned a lot. I did, Matt. Although, do people know about your background? They they don't. I don't think so. It, well, so I have the worst background <laughs> you between do. the three of us. I, I like Roxanne's background. I'm a little worried about how she keeps the soil moist on that plant, though. I feel like it's not- Automa gonna... It's automated. It's um, I'm living in the future. Oh, okay. So, Matt, I thought I was going to talk about how your dad uh, worked at NASA, I think, and made all those rockets and that type of stuff. But if Roxanne's got automated moisture <laughs> plant yeah. stuff, I'm now less interested in the science of whatever you know your family's lineage is, and I want to know more about D to C uh, green thumb <laughs> green thumb plants. Well, I think we're going to leave it with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you both for being on today. Keep in touch, and until next time, everyone, we'll see you. Thanks thank so you. much. Thank you.